The Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, with a word of wisdom from our Father, in Jesus' name, verse 1. For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, it seemed good to me also, Luke that is to say, which means light giver, the light being the truth, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus, which means beloved of God, that thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zecharias of the course of Abiah, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. And the course of Abiah was the eighth of the priestly courses of the ministration in the temple, as we know from First Chronicles chapter 24. These priestly courses were carried out twice a year, and the one that we're reading of in the Gospel of Luke chapter 1 took place in June from the 13th to the 19th. And if you have a companion Bible in Appendix 179, all this is broken down for you, letting you know that at the end of this course, the conception of John the Baptist would take place June 23rd or the 24th of that year. So keep that in mind as we continue, and from there we'll document when Christ was conceived and when the Lord Jesus Christ was born. And we'll be going back to that appendix, Appendix 179 in your Companion Bible, And they had no child because that Elizabeth was barren. So this would be a miraculous birth of John the Baptist, the one who paved the way, the voice crying in the wilderness that was prophesied of in the book of Isaiah in chapter 40. And they were both now well stricken in years. They were elderly, in other words. And it came to pass that while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course, the course of Abiah, and this took place between June 13th and 19th, when you transfer it over to the calendar most people use nowadays, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord, and the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of incense, this being a tradition of man, if you prayed whenever the smoke went up out of the temple, then God would hear your prayers. But again, a tradition of men, God always hears your prayers. Keep in mind, this was before Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. Now, if you want to pray to God, you must use the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, if you want to be heard. And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zechariah saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zecharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John, which means gift of Yahweh, and thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth, for he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God, and he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And Zechariah said unto the angel, Whereby shall I know this? For I am an old man and my wife well stricken in years. And the angel answering said unto him, I am Gabriel, that stand in the presence of God, and am sent to speak unto thee, and to show thee these glad tidings. And behold, thou shalt be dumb, he wanted to sign, there it is, and not able to speak, until the day that these things shall be performed, because thou believest not my words, which shall be fulfilled in their season. And the people waited for Zecharias, and marveled that he tarried so long in the temple. And when he came out, He could not speak unto them, and they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple, for he beckoned unto them and remained speechless. And it came to pass that as soon as the days of his ministration were accomplished, 
he departed to his own house. Now we return to Appendix 179 to understand how long it would take Zechariah to return to his own house, with the course of Abiah ending on June 19th and the following day being a Sabbath, he wouldn't depart until after the 20th of June to transfer it over to our modern day calendar that we use. So as you can see in Appendix 179 of your Companion Bible, the 30 miles journey from Jerusalem to the hill country of Judah where he lived would probably occupy for an old man a couple of days at least. He would therefore arrive at his house on the 21st or 22nd of June. This leaves ample time for the miraculous conception of Elizabeth to take place on or about June 23rd or 24th of that year. So we're talking about June the 23rd or the 24th as far as the conception of John the Baptist is concerned. So June 24th, bear that in mind. And after those days, returning to Luke chapter 1, verse 24, after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived and hid herself five months, saying, Thus hath the Lord dealt with me in the days whereon he looked on me. Take away my reproach among men. So June 24th plus five months is what? November 24th. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin, a spouse to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. So returning to Appendix 179 of the Companion Bible, and for this, go to the beginning of the appendix, where it reads, It thus appears, without the shadow of a doubt, that the day assigned to the birth of the Lord, December 25th, was the day on which he was begotten of the Holy Spirit, and his birth took place on September 29th in the year following, thus making beautifully clear the meaning of John 1.14, the Word became flesh, on December 25th, and tabernacled with us on September 29th, which is the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles. The circumcision, therefore, took place on the eighth day of the feast, which is October 6th or 7th, so that these two momentous events fall into their proper place and order. And the real reason is made clear why the 25th of December is associated with our Lord and was set apart by the apostolic church to commemorate the stupendous event of the word becoming flesh. So there you have it. Take it or leave it. There it is in black and white from the Gospel of Luke and broken down for you by Bullinger in Appendix 179 of the Companion Bible. Notice five months was mentioned as well, and many of you are already familiar with the shortening of Daniel's 70th week, the seven-year-long tribulation of Satan, that is to say, has been shortened to a five-month period. So we have the conception of John, and then five months written of, and then the conception of Christ in the sixth month. So within that, you have the coming of Elijah himself as one of the two witnesses during that five-month period, and immediately after the tribulation of those days, at the end of that five-month-long hour of temptation, the true Christ shall return in his second advent. And what does it say about Christ's second advent in Revelation chapter 19? He returns as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And as we just read in Luke, Mary, his mother, was of the house of David, but she was also of the house of Levi, as we'll document in a moment. And the angel came in unto her, verse 28 of chapter 1 of Luke, and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. And he shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. Again, he will return at the seventh trumpet as king of kings and lord of lords, a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek and the king of Israel. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob, that's all 12 tribes, as well as those grafted in that family tree that we spoke of earlier, forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. As it's also written in the book of Daniel, after the tribulation of Satan, that stone destroys Satan's one world system, speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, and his kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom. 
You can also read of this in Daniel chapter 7, after you read of Satan's one world system, those four beasts, the lion, the bear, the leopard, and Daniel's fourth beast, which is the supernatural, after the fourth beast is destroyed, which includes Satan's role of Antichrist and his fallen angels, the rest of the beasts have their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. The time is the millennium, which begins upon the return of the true Christ at the seventh trumpet, and that season is when Satan is let loose for a short season after the thousand years are finished. Look what it says in verse 13. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man... Christ, the true Christ, came with the clouds of heaven, the attendant angelic host, that is to say, a cloud of angels, and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed. It's forever and ever, both King of Kings and Lord of Lords, Christ coming from both the King line and the Priest line, as we're documenting in Luke chapter 1. Then said Mary unto the angel, verse 34, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? She's a virgin. How can this be? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Spirit shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, underline that, thy cousin Elizabeth. Now what did we learn about Elizabeth in verse 5? She was of the daughters of Aaron. That's the tribe of Levi, the priest line. So Mary, being a cousin of Elizabeth, what does that mean? That Mary's mother and Elizabeth's mother were sisters. And Mary was from the tribe of Judah, from the king line, from David, on her father's side. And in Luke chapter 3, we'll see Mary's genealogy, and we'll document that for a fact as well. So again, behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month with her. Remember, this is happening on December 25th, the date in which the Holy Spirit began to dwell with man, as we'll also document momentarily. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. An elderly woman giving birth to a son, impossible, but not with God. A virgin conceiving and giving birth, not possible, but with God, nothing shall be impossible. And Mary said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord... Be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. And Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste into a city of Judah. Now all of the tribes had Levitical priests living among them. This is why in Revelation 7, you see 12,000 out of each tribe are chosen to receive the seal of God in their forehead. And later on, they're called Levites, as we know from Ezekiel chapter 44. The Levites written of there are the 144,000, and the Levites, the son of Zadok, are the very elect. So this is why Christ is called Melchizedek, the king of the Zadok, the king of the just, a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, having even appeared to Abraham before he was born in the flesh. And that's what we're reading of here is the conception of Christ when the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. So Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste into a city of Judah and entered into the house of Zecharias and saluted Elizabeth, her cousin. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leapt in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Here's your documentation. This is when the Holy Spirit began to dwell with man on earth at this time, December 25th. And she spake out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Emmanuel, God with us, Christ. And whence is this to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? She knew this because of the Holy Spirit within her, John the Baptist being in her womb. For lo, as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in mine ears, the babe leapt in my womb for joy. And blessed is she that believed. For there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from the Lord. 
And Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. For he hath regarded the lowest state of his handmaiden. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. For he that is mighty hath done to me great things, and holy is his name. Yahweh is his name. Jesus means Yahweh's Savior. And his mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. He hath showed strength with his arm. He hath scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He hath put down the mighty from their seats, from their thrones, that is to say. We just read of that in Daniel 7, in the futurist sense and exalted them of low degree. Looking forward to the second advent in Daniel 7, whenever the thrones of the kings of the earth are destroyed, as well as Satan's throne, Satan's seat, that you can read of in Revelation. All that's destroyed upon the seventh trumpet, as you can also document in Revelation chapter 19, the beast and the false prophet being blotted out of existence forever and ever. Those aren't two individuals. It's Daniel's fourth beast, which includes Satan's role of Antichrist. Satan himself will be blotted out of existence forever and ever after the thousand years are finished. After that, the great white throne judgment takes place, and that's when people are actually saved from the lake of fire, because everyone that isn't found worthy to go into the eternity are cast into the lake of fire and blotted out of existence. But it's not God's will that any should perish, but that all come to repentance. What is it to perish? is to perish in that lake of fire. That's why it says in John 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's continued existence from the day you were created in the first world age up into the eternity, the third world age. And in that same chapter, chapter 3 of the Gospel of John, John the Baptist says... He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life. Everlasting life, that is to say, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Now, what did he say there? He that believeth not the Son. In other words, the words that the Son spake, and we have them recorded here for us in the Gospels. And returning to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1 and verse 54, He hath opened his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, as he spake to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his seed forever. Now, as we know from Galatians 3, the seed of Abraham was always speaking of Christ Jesus. So it's only through Christ Jesus that you can become a child of God again. That's the only way you can return to your heavenly father is through the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no other way. So if you're in Christ, then you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise, the promised land, which is the eternity, everlasting life. And Mary abode with her about three months and returned to her own house. So now Elizabeth has come to term three months after the sixth month of pregnancy with Elizabeth makes nine months. Now Elizabeth's full time came that she should be delivered and she brought forth a son. And her neighbors and her cousins heard how that the Lord had showed great mercy upon her, and they rejoiced with her. And it came to pass on the eighth day they came to circumcise the child, and they called him Zacharias after the name of his father. And this would be three months after December 25th, about March 28th or 29th, according to Bullinger in Appendix 179 of your Companion Bible. You have it there broken down for you, the conception of John, June 23rd or 24th, the birth of John, March 28th or 29th, the miraculous begetting, December 25th of Christ, and the nativity, the birth of Christ, September 29th, the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles, which is when Christ began to tabernacle with man, Emmanuel, God with us. And in as much as we mentioned the five months earlier, with five months even being written of in this first chapter, you might want to think of the term of the locust mentioned in Revelation chapter 9, that locust army in the five months. It's May through September, and the end of September is September 29th. Will Christ return at the end of September? Nobody knows, but just something to keep in mind, just in case that's how it goes down. It could very well happen that way, but then again, be instant in and out of season, because it could happen at any time of the year. But just something to keep in mind, as far as the five months is concerned, it is, after all, the term of the locust. 
May through September, that locust army being Satan's angels that are cast out of heaven with him at the woe of the fifth trumpet. Then that one world political system emerges, after which it receives a deadly wound, and then at the woe of the sixth trumpet, Satan appears as the false Christ, and that's when God's elect are delivered up, at which time the Holy Spirit speaks through them, and the two witnesses will be here at that time, and they are most likely Moses and Elijah, and John again came forth in the spirit and power of Elijah, and if they would have accepted it, he would have counted as that Elijah, and Christ would have taken the throne of David at that time. But they rejected John, beheaded him, and they rejected Christ. They crucified him. So it didn't happen then. We have to wait until the second advent, which is how it would always be, because God knows his children. He knows how they're stubborn and hard-hearted, and he knew of the Kenites. And it was because of the wickedness of the Kenites that they were utilized to bring forth the negative part of God's plan. Because without the crucifixion, there would be no repentance, because it's repentance that cleanses you from sin, because Christ paid the price on the cross for one and all times. And if you don't understand all that, just think about it, take it to the Father, Take it to him in prayer, whereby you understand God's overall plan of salvation. Hebrews chapter 9 might help you. Going to verse 11 of Hebrews chapter 9 real quickly. But Christ being come and high priest of good things to come, a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, king of the just, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building. Again, he was born on the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles, which was a shadow of things to come. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an ephor, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, the only begotten Son of God, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot, without blemish, he was perfect, to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is a force after men are dead, otherwise it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth, just like a last will and testament. Whereupon, neither the first testament was dedicated without blood, for when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats, with water and scarlet wool and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book and all the people. The word, that is to say, that's why he sprinkled the book and the people, making that connection between us and the word of God, Christ Jesus. Because if you're in Christ, then you're Abraham's seed, and you can communicate with your heavenly Father and repent of your sins, then being erased at that time, and then you can communicate and commune with your heavenly father. That's the whole point, returning to the father, saying, this is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle, which was a shadow of things to come, Christ, that is to say, and all the vessels of the ministry. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission, no forgiveness. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, symbolic of the true, in other words, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. And what did we read in Daniel chapter 7 a few moments ago? Do you remember? In verse 13 of Daniel chapter 7, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven. Remember those clouds in the book of Acts whenever he ascended to the Father? And came to the Ancient of Days, that is the Father, and they brought him near before him. That's what it's speaking of, Christ's ascension after his death, burial, and resurrection. For you, for whosoever will believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. 
So again, Hebrews 9.24, For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us, nor yet that he should offer himself often, as the high priest entered into the holy place every year with blood of others. Remember the course of Abiah that we read of in the beginning of Luke. That's why we're going here, so that you can better understand what that was symbolic of. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. Only one time, the crucifixion, that is to say. That was the sacrifice for one in all times, because Christ was and is perfect. But now, once in the end of the world, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, whosoever will, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation as King of kings and Lord of lords, as we know from Revelation 19, as well as Daniel chapter 7. So returning to Luke chapter 1 and verse 59, and it came to pass that on the eighth day they came to circumcise the child, John that is to say, and they called him Zecharias after the name of his father, and his mother answered and said, Not so, but he shall be called John, because that's what Gabriel said to name him. And they said unto her, There is none of thy kindred that is called by this name. And they made signs to his father how he would have him called. And he asked for a writing table and wrote, saying, His name is John. And they marveled all. And his mouth was opened immediately, and his tongue loosed, and he spake and praised God. And fear came on all that dwelt round about them, and all these sayings were noised abroad throughout all the hill country of Judea. And all they that heard them laid them up in their hearts, saying, What manner of child shall this be? And the hand of the Lord was with him. And his father Zecharias was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people, and hath raised up an horn of salvation, horns being symbolic of power, for us in the house of his servant David, as he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began, those chosen from before the foundation of the world, those who fought Satan in the first world age even, who were chosen to bring forth the word of God in this flesh age, this second world age. They don't have free will, in other words, and John is one of these, obviously, one of God's election, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all them that hate us to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant the oath which he sware to our father Abraham that he would grant unto us that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. And thou, child, shalt be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins, and John would baptize with water, which will also be symbolic of the cleansing of sin that was to come. Only upon Christ's death, burial, and resurrection can your sins be erased. Only then could people become Christians, that is to say, because the testator must die for the testament to go into effect, as we just covered in Hebrews chapter 9. Very simple. It's not complicated. It might be overwhelming at first, but study it. Don't give up on it. Look into it. Read the book of Hebrews. There's nothing complicated about it. God so loved the world that he came in the flesh himself as the son to pay the price for one and all times so that you can go into the eternity. It's as simple as that. To give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit in the Holy Spirit and was in the deserts till the day of his showing unto Israel.